go. All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the next installment, uh, the Oz Geometric PD seminar. Uh, Philip Schrader is going to talk today uh, from over in WA uh, on the convergence of Sobolev gradient trajectories to Elastica. So um, take it away, Phil. Sure. Okay, so first I just want to introduce Sobolev gradients. Um, and I'm going to do that um not at first with elastica but or or the the gradient trajectory that i'll talk about eventually um but first of all oh my laser point is not working um first of all just with the uh the curve shortening flow um because it's a little bit simpler um Right, so uh, it's, I guess it's mo f familiar to most of you, particularly Paul. Um, but the so the curve shortening flow uh, is a gradient flow of the length functional. So if we have uh, gamma, uh, in this case, we'll look at the plane. So gamma is a embedding of the circle in R two. Uh, then its length is given by this, where the norm here is the Euclidean one. Um, <clears throat> and then the variational derivative, so the derivative of length in the direction of a um, vector field along the curve is given by this formula here. And if we integrate by parts um, in this thing, then uh, we get something that maybe is a little more familiar. So we'll get V and then um, I guess, well, we, we write this as the unit tangent vector and um, we can use the arc length derivative here. Okay, so I've integrated my parts there and also I'm using ds equals gamma dash of u du and um, so the derivative with respect to s is 1 over gamma dash, normal gamma dash times the derivative with respect to um, the natural parameter of the curve, d du. Okay. Uh, and so this, depending on your convention, this Ts is um, either negative or positive Kn, the curvature times the normal. Um, right, so the, then the gradient of length, so the gradient of something, of some functional is the it's just the Reese representative of um, of the derivative, right? And so it depends on the choice of inner product. So what inner product are we using here on our vector space of things like this? So um, vector fields along the curve. Okay. So to get uh, gradient to get a gradient so a vector field along the curve that uh, represents the derivative of length then we need to choose an inner product uh, and so there's lots of different ways you can do that actually um, if we use just the, the usual l2 inner product so this thing here then uh, our gradient should be what um, well, okay, so we need to go back up here. All right, and then just, well, we need to integrate by parts there and then not do, not go into arc length parameterization. Uh, and when you do that, you get, well, that the gradient should be just d to u of t, right? Um, negative of that. Okay. 
uh, and that's not not what we know of as the um, the curve shortening flow, right? The curve shortening flow is actually the gradient of length in this um, this inner product here, which I call the L two DS inner product um, because it's L two with respect to arc length. Okay. And so then in that case, we get just looking at here. So our equation for the derivative then in arc length parameterization, in that case, we get a, an, um, a gradient of, uh, let's see, is that, yeah, so negative TS which might be curvature times the normal. Okay. Um, so a couple of things I want to point out here. This L2D DS product depends on gamma. Um, okay. Depends on gamma, depends where we are. And so it's actually a Riemannian metric. It's not just an inner product on the space of curves. Um, and it's also only well-defined actually on immersions. So it's defined on here, the space of immersions, um, which I'm calling M1. So it's all the curves in H1 with non-zero um, derivative, non-zero tangent. Okay. And then so curve shortening flow if we want to be really precise, is the gradient flow of length in M1 with this Riemannian metric L2DS. Okay. But then um, this is, have I opened the wrong thing? No, that's right. Okay, this is actually from 2006 or 2005, maybe. Um, there's a theorem. Miko and Mumford have studied these kinds of spaces. So immersions, quotient spaces, spaces of immersions um, divided by the action of diffeomorphism on S1, so the action of reparameterization. Uh, they studied these for applications in um, shape matching or just yes, trying to get um, quantify the difference between two shapes. That's their main sort of motivation for this stuff. And they found that the metric distance that you get in this Riemannian metric, so um, remembering that the, the distance in a Riemannian geometry is um, the infimum over all the paths that join the two points of the path length in that Riemannian metric. Um, and so they found that if you if you use the L2DS as your Riemannian metric, then the distance that you get on this space of this quotient space um, is trivial. So it's always zero. Uh, and this is also true on the full space of immersions, um, just with a, a pretty straightforward extension of what they did. Um, Okay, so this is that means this is a little bit of a weird metric to use in as as a Riemannian metric. Um, it doesn't mean that it's bad. It's a bad gradient because it's still a, good, a perfectly good inner product, and it gives you a direction, a, a perfectly good direction of descent for the length functional. Um, but this does sort of beg the question, what happens in other metrics? So if we, if we choose other metrics where the metric distance is not trivial, um, then what kind of behavior do we get? Can we use the fact that the metric distance is non-trivial um, to give us convergence information or things like that? Um, so that's something that I explore with 
uh, Glenn and Valentina Wheeler in this specific case where uh, we looked at this H1DS metric um, defined here. So it's got the L2DS part, of course, and then arc length de derivatives um, in an H1 part. So then how do we get um, the gradient of length with respect to this kind of metric? Uh, what we do, well, of course, we need the derivative of length, which I've just copied down again here. And then um, what we did was we integrate by parts in the, uh, in the H1DS metric. And so this is sort of a weak version of things. And we find, um, let me do it the other way. You get W minus W, WSS, V, DS. Okay, and so if our gradient uh, derivative of length is that, then just matching things up. Um, well, this should be by definition the H1 DS gradient um, of L <clears throat> uh, at this curve. I guess it's been called C. V. Okay, this should be the H1 DS in a product here. And so to make that work, then this thing um, should satisfy a, an ODE. So it should satisfy the gradient. Uh, and then, so do it around this way. Gradient, second derivative of this gradient minus itself. should be equal to Kn, okay? And so if we can solve that, then, um, then we, we have our H1DS gradient um, of length. All right, so how do we solve that? Well, we just get a fundamental solution to the ODE um, here. And because this is in, oops, because this is in terms of S, so the arc length parameter, um, this function G is implicitly dependent on, um, on the base curve as well. So actually I've been calling that gamma. Yeah. Okay, so I meant to have that, have a gamma here. Oops. Okay. And maybe a gamma there. Okay, so the this function G, this Green's function, um, depends on gamma. But we can solve it uh, with a little bit of work. We find that this does the job, uh, where little L is just the length of gamma. So it depends, this depends on gamma in the arc length parameter and also in um, L. Okay, and then how this works is that we, uh, to find a solution to this, you just integrate against the fundal, fundamental solution. So you take a convolution um, of Kn with, well, so that should be Ks tilde and S tilde with G, S, S tilde. Okay. Uh, so that gives us our H1DS gradient. Um, and the H1DS curve shortening flow then uh, is it's just the negative of that because we want gradient descent. Um, did I not copy that? Okay. 
Okay. Um, right, so that will be our H1 DS curve shortening flow. And then one thing to note here is that by construction, uh, this gradient is in H1. And so this is an, an ODE on this uh, space of immersions that we that I defined earlier. Okay, so I'm sorry, it's not really a PDE, um, although it's sort of a partial integral differential equation um, if you look at it here. Um, okay, and so then, as I said, uh, I looked into this a bit with Glenn and Valentin and Wheeler, and we found one of the things we found was that there's a unique eternal solution for any initial curve. Uh, and as T goes to infinity, it converges in H1 to a constant map. Okay. And we, all, we also found some nice things about um, the asymptotic shape, but we didn't find that it converges um, to a circle. It sort of runs out of reshaping power at some point. Um, so there's a little bit more to investigate there. Now, coming back to elastica, so the, the bending energy, um, this is sometimes called the modified bending energy. So here, our energy function for the elastic, elastica problem um, is the integral of curvature squared plus some constant. So this is in effect, um, it's equal to Because of the, the ds, this is equal to integral of curvature ds plus lambda squared times the length. So there's sort of a length penalty there, um, which stops us from having the minima as infinitely large circles. Um, okay, you can find the derivative of this in, in the variational, using the variational kind of derivative as before it comes out to that and then integrating by parts in there we get what i call the um l2 ds gradient of this energy uh, and it comes out to be that expression um, which is maybe a little more familiar um, now the natural domain for this energy is actually uh, immersions with two derivatives. So M, M2, that's a set of, um, let's say just M1, but they're in H2 as well. Okay, so we've got a slightly higher class of differentiability. And so the natural thing to do here, or natural from my point of view, um, is to use an H2DS metric. Um, and so that's similar to the H1DS, but higher order. Okay. And then when we do that, um, what do we get here? Well, okay. So then the H2DS gradient, by basically the same argument as I just went through for the curve shortening um, should come out to be the integral of some Green's function against the L2 gradient. Okay. Um, right. Is there a chat that I'm not following? Ah, no questions. There it is. Okay. Just let me know if something doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, that should be, the H2DS gradient should be the um, convolution of the L2 DS gradient with the Green's function 
that now satisfies a fourth order, um, a fourth order ODE, because that's what you get when you integrate this by parts. Okay, that satisfies this weekly. Um, and so the H2DS curve straightening flow. So because this is minimizing curvature, it's sometimes called curve straightening, um, is the negative of that. Okay. So I said it's it's sometimes called curve straightening. The first people to call it that, I think, were Langer and Singer, um, who have a paper from 1985. And in that paper, they reduced the problem to um, an H1 type gradient on the derivatives of arc length parameterized curves. So they fixed the parameterization um, and then look at this on a different space, basically. Um, and so it's an H1 type gradient on the derivatives, which is effectively an H2 gradient that looks a bit like this. Okay, it's equivalent to the, the typical H2 gradient because they're fixing points. Um, and so that so this is then equivalent to your standard H2 um, by uh, sort of Poincare Wertinger inequality. Um, <clears throat> okay, but then uh, Lina followed on from these guys. And he he found at some point that with, with sort of numerical experience that if you use this metric to find your gradient, um, then the solutions sort of rotate um, as as they straighten. Uh, and someone asked him why they're rotating, and then he investigated this. And in this paper in two thousand and three, he compared. The gradient you get from this to the gradients that you get from these two things. Um, and he found that the flows are geometrically different, right? Um, for example, only, only the gradient that you get from number two um, preserves the symmetries of rotation and reflection. Okay, so it does matter. Um, for the geometry of the flow, uh, which of these gradients you use, <clears throat> um, which of these Riemannian metrics you use to get your gradient. Okay. Um, some other work was done by Wen in 1993. Um, so that was an L2 gradient on derivatives. So that's effectively an H1 gradient. Uh, and then since then, many, many authors have studied the L2DS gradient. So including Wen, Queso, Polden, DKS, and DPS. Um, and the typical results that people find are existence with smooth initial data, subconvergence to Elastica, so uh, convergence of a subsequence along the flow. And then there are some results with full convergence, um, but these are usually modulo, or actually they're always modulo, reparameterization and translation. Um, and there's a reason for that that I'll get to soon. Um, and so um, this, I should have mentioned earlier, uh, this talk is based on joint work with Shinya Okabe, at um, Tohoku University. Uh, and so we found last year that with this flow, this um, H2DS gradient, we could get um, unique, a unique global solution for any initial immersed curve uh, and show also that it converges to an elastica as T tends to infinity in the H2DS, the topology that you get from this H2DS 
Riemannian metric. Um, and so that's a bit of an improvement on the other kinds of flows. This is also a very symmetric flow, as, as you'd expect, but we haven't really explored that very much. Um, right, but um, yeah, so the differences there, uh, unique existence, and also that we didn't have to do any of this modulo reparameterization and translation. And that's essentially a consequence of this theorem by Bruverus. Um, so I've mentioned that this is an ODE. Actually, I may, maybe I only said that for um, the curve shortening one. But um, again, by construction, the H2 DS gradient should be an H2, right? Um, and so this is an ODE on um, the space of immersions with the two square integrable derivatives. Um, and so existence and uniqueness, the thing you should use then is um, Picard's theorem in infinite dimensions. So that's what we do. Um, turns out you can just show that the right-hand side is Lipschitz. Um, so that's how we get short time existence and uniqueness. And then for global existence and also later for convergence, we, we apply this theorem um, from Breveris, who is a student of Miko and sort of continued some of this um, comparison of shapes work. Uh, and he found that the immersions um, class H2 with this H2 DS metric form a complete Riemannian metric space. Um, unlike uh, the L2 DS, where it's 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 trivial, um, the the geodesic distance vanished, um, and so it's not geodesically complete, and it's also not metrically complete. Um, Riveras was able to show that for H two, this is metrically complete. <clears throat> um, okay, and how do we use that? Well. First of all, we can use that to get global existence pretty easily from the short time existence. And the way that goes is like this. Um, well, first of all, we've got a consequence here, which is that it follows, it follows that if, um, if we've got a curve with finite H2 DS length, so, this is the H2 to the DS length of our curve. Um, then the limit as T approaches B exists because this is a complete metric space, uh, complete Riemannian metric space. And now that means if we suppose that um, we have a maximal solution curve to our H2 DS gradient flow, and then if we write the energy at time t um, along the flow and take the derivative with respect to t, then what should we get? Well, that will be dE um, x times xt t, uh, which is by definition of the gradient and by the fact that this is the negative gradient flow, this will be gradient of E um, in a product with itself. Okay, in the H2 DS in a product. Um, something else I wanted to say there. Uh, and yeah, so this is just obviously just the norm. 
the negative of the norm of the gradient. Um, okay. And so then if we integrate this um, with respect to T, uh, is that what I want to do? Yeah, I'm integrating this guy with respect to T. Then the fundamental theorem of calculus tells me this. Uh, okay. That should be equal to the negative of the integral from zero to t of the norm of the gradient. And the norm, well, the norm of the gradient is the norm of um, the time derivative of x. Okay. And so that tells us that in particular, the integral from zero to capital T, so remember X is a maximal solution curve defined uh, on the interval zero to capital T. So the integral from zero to capital T of um, X T should be equal to um, e at zero, energy at zero minus energy at t, and that is less than or equal to the energy at zero. Okay, uh, and then that tells us by holders in, uh, yeah, by holders in equality. Should I have a square here? I should. I've forgotten the square, sorry. Um, that's actually the norm squared. The squares here. And then holders inequality is thus that the length of this portion of um, the gradient flow should be less than or equal to the square root of t times the energy at zero. All right, that tells us that if t is finite, then the h to ds length of our flow um, is finite, or the gradient flow is finite, and so that's what this is saying, right? The length, this is integrating with respect to T. Okay, this length here is finite, if T is finite. And so the limit as little t approaches big T exists by um, that little, that follows from the completeness, as I mentioned just above. Um, and if that limit exists, then we can start the flow there again. And this contradicts the maximality of capital T. Okay. And so then we, we get um, global existence of the gradient flow nice and easily, just from the, essentially from the completeness of the space. Um, and we should note also from this thing here, that we can take the limit as t goes to infinity. And so this, we have this estimate here for the, um, the norm squared. Now this combined with um, the sort of a direct method, so the boundedness of the energy will give us a convergent subsequence of some sort. Um, and if we combine that uh, convergent in H1 um, up to reparameterization and translation, and we can combine that with this estimate here to get that, um, 
there's a subsequence that converges to a stationary point. Uh, but that doesn't give us full convergence. Um, just And just to sort of explain the difference, here's an example that I'm borrowing from a talk I saw by Peter, I think it was Peter Topping. Um, you might have a, a gradient flow that does something like this, coming down and around a cylinder. And I don't know if I'm drawing this well enough. Approaching, approaching this loop around the bottom, but sort of exponentially decaying to it, maybe. Now, um, for this kind of thing, then going down any vertical direction, we get a convergent subsequence. So this subconverges, but it doesn't converge because it keeps going round and round. And I think um, maybe some people know more about this than me, but I think Peter Topping constructed an example of um, a non-converging mean curvature flow using uh, this kind of picture. Okay, so um, subconvergence isn't is sometimes you know, maybe sometimes we want more than subconvergence. Uh, it'd be nice to have full convergence. Um, and so let's look at how to do that. Um, to prove in this case that we have a full convergence, it would be enough to upgrade um, this estimate here, this L2 in time estimate to an L1 in time estimate, because then by the sorts of arguments I've just been talking about. Um, well, this L1 in time estimate tells us that the length of the trajectory is finite. And so because our space is complete, it will converge to something. Um, okay. And so that's the idea behind convergence by gradient inequality. Um, so for now, I'll just look at sort of a general situation where we've got some energy. We're taking a, um, a negative gradient flow with respect to um, some inner product on a Hilbert space. And we know because it's a gradient flow um, that this S, this kind of estimate will work. So where is it? So, I mean, this is this is actually completely general for um, a gradient flow, and so we get this L two in. We always get this L two in time estimate. Um, so in our general case, we're going to assume that and. Assume that um, there's a, a convergent subsequence with respect to the norm on H. Okay. And then suppose we can prove that for X in an H ball around the, um, the stationary point around the limit. Suppose we can prove that there exists a ball around the limit and a constant C and another constant theta such that this thing holds. So this is saying that the size of the gradient dominates the difference between the energies, um, the energy at X and the energy at the, the stationary point. Okay, so suppose all that's true. Um, and then what we're going to do is look at this convergent, this convergence subsequence. And then for each TI, I'll let capital TI be the maximal time um, such that 
the trajectory is contained in that ball. So I mean, I don't mean you, I mean the ball, the ball where our gradient inequality holds. Okay. And then the claim here is that there exists J such that the eventually the, the escape time goes to infinity. So it doesn't escape from um from this ball. So we've got like we've got x of t i in here. Uh, and then we do the flow and then maybe it leaves. Uh, it, it goes outside the ball where the gradient inequality holds. But it can't keep doing that. That's the claim. So there's some other um, some other TJ where it doesn't escape. And the, the reason is if I have, I don't know, if I have lots of these. Okay, then um, these lengths, I can't, I can't have infinitely many of them because those lengths will add up and they'll make, um, that should be squared. They'll make this quantity unbounded, okay? So that can't happen. There needs to be a value of, uh, a value J where eventually the whole trajectory stays inside um, this ball where we have a gradient inequality. Okay, and so then we can define this function here, which is the difference between um, x, the energy at x of t and the energy at infinity. And then we take the negative of the derivative of this. Okay, and we'll, I'll see. We'll see in a moment while we're doing this. Um, so the negative of the derivative will be negative one minus theta times this energy and the energy at infinity to the power of uh, so it's theta, negative theta times um, e dash x of t, uh, ddt, that's probably better. Okay, now I calculated ddt of the energy before. Um, where was that? I showed you up here that if we calculate the derivative of the energy, then we get the negative norm squared of the gradient. Okay. And that's always true for these kinds of things. So here, this comes out to be, just copy that and then multiply it by, uh, is that right? Let me just check. Yeah, so the negatives disappear and we have the H2DS. Sorry, I'm just doing a general H norm here at the moment. So the norm squared. Okay, and now we can use the gradient inequality um, on this part here. Okay, so it's to power of negative theta so looking here, the inequality should go around the other way. Um, when we put this in, so one minus theta. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. 
uh, and there should be a constant c inverse. Okay, so just using this. Um, right, so the, the square is gone, okay? That's why we did that. That's the crucial part that's going to help us get an L1 estimate instead of an L2 one. So now we integrate, um, we integrate phi dash and we find, uh, let's see, one, well, we integrate each side basically. One minus theta c dash um, integral of okay. Well, the the gradient um, this gradient is equal to our velocity. Okay. Um, and this should be less than or equal to, uh, so we're integrating from zero, we should use a dummy variable here. Sorry, I mean to integrate from, from tj, so tj, um, remembering after the tj, this whole trajectory is contained inside the ball where the inequality applies. So we can integrate all the way to infinity from Tj and this inequality still holds. Okay. And this should be less than or equal to um, V of T minus V of Tj. Minus V of at infinity. Okay. Um, and so phi at infinity is zero. If we look here. Um, and so this is just phi of tj. And we can rearrange it. And it's just saying now that the length of our trajectory after tj, and therefore as a whole, is bounded. Okay. So that length, that length is, is finite now. And so assuming that h is complete, um, we have convergence, okay? So that's the kind of argument that works for these things. If you can establish um, a gradient inequality, okay? And there are lots of different ways of doing that. Probably the most, well, sometimes you, you can get away with ad hoc methods or, you know, just rearranging things and you get a nice inequality. That's what happened with the H1DS um h1ds curve shortening flow um, but here we we ended up needing something more powerful um, and this is probably the most well-known thing it's the loyashevich simon gradient inequality um, so i think loyashevich did this in finite dimensions and found that if your function was analytic then you get a gradient inequality and then leon simon um, came up with an infinite dimensional adaptation of that um, for uh, a PDE. Um, so there's lots of different versions of this. I'm, I'm taking one by Fian and Meridakis from a paper they wrote in 2020, that was published in 2020. Um, and that goes like this. Uh, we, I have actually simplified it a little to apply to the current situation where our flow is in the same, um, our flow is happening in a Hilbert space, basically. 
um, because it's an ODE. Okay, so in this case, um, if we have an open set, you know, Hilbert space and an energy function on that open set and a critical point, if E, if the energy is analytic and the second derivative at the critical point, whoops, second derivative at the critical points um, is Fred home with index zero, then a gradient inequality holds. Okay, so they proved this in quite a lot of generality. Um, and this is what we would hope to use for the um, H2DS gradient flow of um, the bending energy. Okay. Did I, did I disconnect at all there, guys? I think my Wi-Fi went funny. That's all good, I think. Okay, cool. Um, thanks. Um, okay, so we want to try and use this um, Loyasherich Simon inequality, uh, gradient inequality for our bending energy problem, but there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a hiccup. So first of all, it's not, it's not too difficult to show that the bending energy, well, well actually the mod modified bending energy um, is analytic. Uh, it takes a little bit of work, but it's not hard. Um, however, this energy is reparameterization invariant. And that causes problems because the um, the group reparameterization group is infinite dimensional, and so this means any critical point comes with a whole family of reparameterizations, and so the kernel of the second derivative can't be finite. Um, because there's this infinite dimensional group of um, of things at the same energy level, so um, so that's a problem for proving that the second derivative is Fredholm. Um, okay, so the the symmetry, the reparameterization reparameterization symmetry causes this problem, but it also turns out to give us the solution. Um, so what we can do is define omega as the set of um, curves in M2 whose speed is equal to their length. So these are the arc length proportionally parameterized curve curves. Um, and then we can prove that omega is an analytic submanifold of the space of immersions. So this, these immersions, um, they form an open subset of H2. So there it's a manifold and omega is actually an analytic submanifold. Um, okay. Oh, I've gone for quite a long time. Sorry, Kyle. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, are, are we happy for me to go a little bit longer? Everyone else? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'll still be here and recording and everything. So just uh, carry on. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll get hungry eventually, but uh, for now, yeah, me okay. too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's not too much longer, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, so then we can prove that omega is an analytic submanifold, and so then the restriction of the energy to omega is also analytic. Um, and then because um, omega sort of breaks the reparameterization symmetry by fixing a parameterization, we don't have this problem with the infinite dimensional kernel, 
and we can prove that E restricted to Omega is Fredholm. Okay, so that's good. We get uh, Loyashevich Simon inequality on Omega. So we get for um, alpha and alpha infinity in Omega if the um, if they're contained in a ball, so there's a sigma, there exists a sigma such that we get a gradient inequality um, for the derivative of E restricted to omega, okay? And then I said the symmetry gets us out of this as well. Um, because alpha and alpha infinity are arc length reparameterizations, or they can be arc length reparameterizations of gamma and gamma infinity, um, we can then show that, uh, well, first of all, because they're equal, they are reparameterizations, the energies are the same. So this right-hand side, we can convert easily to be in terms of gammas. Okay. Um, and then... I think I want this here. Yeah. Just keep that there. Um, all right. Uh, and this, this is in H star, by the way. Um, or H, H2 star. Um, uh, and then, you know, it takes a little bit more work, but we can, there's a, um, an inequality between the H2DS gradient and um, this derivative, the, the norm of this derivative. Uh, and so this is now at gamma. And it's an H2DS norm. Okay, so this sort of gives us, yeah, essentially what we need. Um, a gradient inequality for these things. Um, yeah. Okay. Bill, can I ask a quick question? Yes, please. Um, yeah, just when you, so you more or less um, quotient out and consider the parameterizations by arc length. Are there, yeah. Do you have any issue with the potential um, being able to start your arc length at different points or go around the curve in one direction or the other? Is... Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, sorry. So, so do you mean starting the flow or? No, I mean, when you've got your parameterization, right? And you want to parameterize by, you want to quotient out and think of all your curves parameterized by arc length, right? Yeah. So, and, and so is there, do you have to choose a particular starting point or it doesn't matter? Like the, I'm thinking from the point of view of um, the getting the analyticity, right? Uh... I'm just asking if that if that's an issue or that's not an issue here. You get a null direction corresponding to translation of your parameter, but I think that's that's okay in this Wojciechowicz format. That's okay, and also if you go round the other way, that's also okay. Um, uh, well, you start with some parameterization, so you just yep. keep the same sense. I think but you keep the same sense, or you have to kind of combine the two opposite senses or? I, no, I think you're just following along this manifold of, of constant speed parameterized curves, right? So. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you won't be jumping around. Yeah, yep. I think. Okay, thanks. I think that's right. Thank you. Um, okay, so we find this, um, this H2DS gradient inequality. Okay. Um, but then there's another problem. To, to use the inequality, 
Um, so as I demonstrated in the sort of general sense here, where was it? Yeah, here. It was it was a ball. The gradient inequality is inside a ball. Um, in in our case, it would be in the H two. It would be an H two ball, um, and so we need H two subconvergence, not just H one subconvergence. Um, and so I mentioned briefly earlier that that the bounding the energy only gives us um, H1 subconvergence, and it's only up to the translation and reparameterization. Um, that's because the highest order term is parameterization invariant, um, and also there's no zeroth order term, so that there's nothing to lock down the translation. Um, okay, so um, it turns out that we can upgrade this um, using estimates on the second derivative, we can upgrade this to H2 convergence, but still up to translation, so still modulo translation and reparameterization. Um, and then, but then what we can do, because we have this gradient inequality, is um, compare the two things um, in the way I'll explain in a moment. And I just before I do that, I just want to mention also that um, in in that proving that H two DS immersion with immersions is a complete metric space, Bruveris also pro proves that um, the topologies are locally equivalent. So if you if you take an open ball that stays inside the space of immersions, um, then there's a there's also a, if you take an H two open ball, there's also an H two DS open ball. So in this these pictures, it doesn't matter if I use H2 or H2DS open balls. Um, okay, so what we've got is we've got our um, we've got our gradient flow. So here's XTI. Maybe that is inside the H2DS ball where our gradient inequality is applicable. But then x to x t j because we only have h one subconvergence of the 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 flow, um, we don't know that that's inside an h two d s ball. But we do know that it's true for the reparameterized and translated flow. So I'll, I'll keep calling this alpha. Here's the alpha t i. Alpha TJ is in there as well. Okay. And so now what we can do is we let gamma I be the H2DS gradient flow that starts at alpha TI. Okay. So alpha TI is here. And here's gamma, gamma, uh, gamma I of T. So gamma I of T is the, the gradient flow, H2DS gradient flow starting there. Um, and then gamma I of T is actually a time independent reparameterization of um, our original flow. The problem with trying to do what I'm about to do just with the alphas is that that's a time dependent reparameterization so just going from X to alphas, um, you have to have a time dependent reparameterization and that messes with the, um, the gradient flow equation. So, but gamma, gamma doesn't have that problem. It's, a, it's time independent. It's a reparameterization just from this condition. Um, and so gamma has this nice property then uh, that it has the same size as x of t or has the same gradient because this the gradient um the gradient flow is invariant under reparameterization we know that h2 ds the gradient at um, x of t is equal to this guy 
gamma of t um, for t greater than ti. And so if these, right, and so I, I meant to mention that the problem with this, um, the problem with this is that we can't, we can't get to a point where um, the trajectory stays inside the ball where the loyashevich simon gradient inequality holds, okay? But then over here we can, because, because of this, this means that if these gamma i's, so remember alpha is getting closer and closer, alpha of ti is getting closer and closer. So if these gamma i's always leave the ball, then because they have the, um, these little sections have the same length, the, the same si size of the gradient, um, if they always leave the ball, then that will mean that the integral of xt squared dt um, from ti to infinity is unbounded. And that contradicts uh, the energy estimate that we got, that you always get for the L2 in time um, size of the trajectory, All right? And, and so then that means that there exists a, a TN such that, um, such that the integral Again, just repeating that um, the Loyashevich Simon, the use the use of the gradient inequality that I showed in general, um, we can then show that we get an L one in time estimate, and then so the length of the trajectory is finite. The H two D S length of the trajectory is finite which means it converges because H2DS gives us a complete metric space, converges in H2DS and then also by that result of Breveris, it's converging in H2. Okay. Um, all right, so that's, sorry, I've gone a bit over time. Here's, here's some references for the things I mentioned. Um, and if there are any questions, happy to attempt to answer them. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, yeah, questions? So am I right to understand, so this, since this is a sort of ODE on the function space, yeah. that you don't actually expect smoothing in the way you would in, in the, the usual gradient, you know, the PDE gradient flows. Yeah, um, that's right. So you, you don't really, you can, you, you probably don't expect to get better convergence than, than H2, for example. Is that right? Um, yeah, you, you wouldn't be able to get um, sub convergence in H2 with higher order estimates. Yeah. Yeah. Because it doesn't. So, yeah. But that, uh, that okay, another question. Um, if you start with something that's in H2, then you, you can presumably solve at least for a short time backwards in time too. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. We just didn't. Um, yeah, we didn't I mean, the Picard iteration yeah. works kind of as in the finite dimensional case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, it's yeah. Probably eternal. So yeah. Well, okay, but uh, uh, presumably the H2 could blow up, you know, in some finite time in the past. Is that right? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. That either. might be interesting we, to understand. So, but you, yeah, okay. So yeah. you have some maximal extension, which is uh, yeah. exists for all positive time and at least some time backwards. Yes, at least some. Yeah. 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 That's okay. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Quite, a, quite a different flavor from what I'm used to. Yeah. Actually, we found, yeah, with the um, H1DS curve shortening, we found that it was eternal. Um, oh, okay. But, uh, so do you have any idea what can happen as t goes to minus infinity in that case, you know? Um, for the, the shortening? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah, we haven't looked at what happens to the shape. Yeah, hmm. I don't know. It would, 
I think maybe I did some numerical experiments and it just does some really crazy things, but that's hard to manage because it expands and your discretization gets nasty. So. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You said forwards in time was a point, was that right? Constants? No, to a. Um, no. Or to an elastica, right? Oh. To elastica, yeah. Is that right? Which which was the one that was converging to constant maps forwards in time? Oh, so, the H one H one DS curve shortening converged yeah. to a constant. Yeah. 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 Um, it yeah, does yeah. sort of. Yeah. It the yeah with the we did some numerical experiments with that as well, and um, it seems to head towards a circle and then once it shrinks too far it stops changing shape so everything just decays too much and it stops mm -hmm. it just shrinks after a while um, so like a square will go a little bit rounder and then just shrink yeah. okay interesting yeah um so the way you formulated it the, it doesn't have a scaling in there, right? So if you were to start with an initial parameterization, which is say twice as much, then you don't expect, you can't just produce the solution from that initial data from a rescaling of, of the right. solution. Yeah, because yeah. The, the norm is not invariant. Um, yeah. But can you make sense of the, the uh, gradient flow if you just took the top order derivative part? Uh, I guess you, um, the Green's function is sort of not invertible. You have some kernel, but uh, I'm not sure whether it can still make sense of something. Uh, so you take the norm to be just the just the integral of second derivative squared, say. Oh. Um, um, so presumably you, you have to somehow factor out the constant, you know, the, the kernel of that, including which, what is that? Maybe just mm. the constants, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't thought about that one, but um, there is a way to make it, you add a factor of length and make it scale invariant. Right. Uh, sorry. And and get the yeah, make it scale invariant and then get a time. Just with a power um, of factor of the length. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's sort of a work in progress. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um and we're, yeah, and we're thinking that that might then solve our running out of reshaping power. Oh yeah, makes sense. Problem. Right. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> what about um what about higher dimensions as <laughs> curves in higher um, dimensions or uh, so well, area is. functional you know and uh you know is there some yeah. uh say we look at um you know like convex uh you know smooth convex or you know just convex body say and we look at uh immersions from sn into into you probably, one. probably can't can't expect to preserve any pointwise condition like convexity. I think. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. We're sure, but we just look at immersions then from. Yeah. For, I, I was just thinking convexity, just because you've got S n. But let's just just mm. say we're looking at immersions S n into R n plus one. Then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I, we do have... similar tricks, right? So you. Yeah. So what happens for the mean curvature flow, for example, is there a similar, once you go from S1 up to SN, then um, you still, uh, is there a similar kind of Mumford uh, Miko? Has anyone looked at this kind of thing? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think yeah. they've done some higher dimensional things. Um, and then the completeness, the yeah. completeness well, it, you need it, it can't be right because, uh, like yeah. for the mean curvature flow anyway, you can't. Oh, uh, that's too low. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, something else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's also a difficult part there is the Green's function. Right. Um, that's as far as I've got with thinking about that uh -huh. um, or talking about it with um, oh, yeah. Glenn, actually. <laughs> um, where's the Green's function? Uh, here. Yeah. So getting a fundamental solution on the sphere is a bit harder. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've we've thought about it a little bit, but we haven't haven't done mm. anything yet. It's definitely it's definitely interesting though. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. 
Hmm. All right. Um, that's probably long enough, right? Anyone have any other questions? Or Sounds good. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thanks very much. And um, we'll, uh, we'll meet again at the, uh, the next uh, talk. Sounds good. Okay.